ready. Um, so I will uh, tell you today about the illumination of the accretion disk um, in black hole X-ray binaries. Uh, we see reflection from the accretion disk, but we really do not know uh, where it comes from. And people usually um, uh, say, okay, let's assume, let's use the so-called lamp post model where <clears throat> At some height h above the black hole, we put a source and that source illuminates the disk. This is a nice mathematical problem, but it is has no physics in it. Uh, how do you know you're seeing a reflected light? How, how do you see that? In, how in do you know you're seeing the disk? Oh, yes. Disk. Yes, yes. There is a bump in the spectra uh, around 10 to 30 keV. Um, there's, the spectra are power loss coming from Comptonization. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we see a bump between 10 and 30 keV around there, plus an iron line. So we're absolutely certain that there is reflection. OK. Um, so uh, I will say, how do, you know, I how do you know, why does the iron line mean reflection? Why did the iron line? Why does the iron line imply reflection? Ah, uh, well, it, it is uh, photo absorption and then uh, emission. So uh, this there is there is no other way from an accretion disk or from a black hole to get an iron line. What is the origin of the photons that are being uh, reflected? The continuum, the continuum photons, the continuum photons, and and the question is where do these photons uh, come from? You can't do it with collisional excitation. Uh, it, no, 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 no. It it the temperature is way too low for collisional excitation. No. Okay. So it it it's. Uh, um, I think it has been established uh, beyond doubt that the um, that, that it is uh, from uh, reflection of the continuum. The question is, where is the continuum? And as I said, typically people use the so-called lamp post model, where they put a source, a point source, somewhere above the black hole and illuminate the disk with that. Now, as I said, beautiful mathematical tool for studying but no physics. So what I would like to uh, discuss today, and this is our recent paper with Pablo, is that the jet illuminates the disk, and I will tell you how. So we continue. But this is something which was, you sure that this was not considered in the past? I mean, you know, when you think the first thing that comes to mind when you think about illumination from above is the jet. I mean, what, what other sources people have seen? I mean, I'm sure people have thought of something. Um, the question is, uh, what direction was the material moving in? I mean, if the jet's moving outward, then, then it's not obvious. The details are not obvious. Of course. That's why we did a calculation. Thank you, David. Okay. okay. But uh, it's coming. So um, uh, I need to give you, I feel that I need you to give you a lot of background, not some background, a lot of background. Um, and the, so let me do that. I will explain why we use the jet as the source of hard photons that illuminate the accretion disk. And I ask the rhetoric question, is there anything wrong or incomplete with the standard picture? The answer is yes. And let's see what the standard picture of black hole X-ray binaries is and how well it does in explaining the observations. <clears throat> now, in the standard picture, that is the picture that, that our community uh, uses uh, for their daily bread, is based on two strong beliefs. Now, I say strong beliefs to be polite. These are really party lines. And if you don't obey the party lines, you're excluded. Um, so, party line number one says the following. The power law X-ray spectrum 
which is in the form e to the minus gamma. Gamma is the photon number spectral index. And I will use it again and again and again. So remember it. Photon number spectral index uh, in black hole X-ray banners is produced in the corona. Uh, they call corona the hot inner flow. I will say more about it. Um, by inverse Comptonization of soft uh, black body photons from the accretion disk. Okay, fine. I have no objection with that. It, uh, let me give you a, uh, a schematic. Um, I wish I had the abilities of Antoine to make beautiful uh, graphs with the computer, but uh, I'm too old for that and I will probably never learn. So I did it by hand. Here's the black hole. Um, and the outer part of the flow is a thin accretion disk called Shakura Sunyaev. And the inner part of the disk is a, is a, a thick, geometrically hot inner flow. Um, should I say a few more words about the Shakura Sunyaev disk? Or maybe I should, I, I will not ask. It has been proven analytically by Shakura and Sunyaev back in 73, that uh, uh, if you have a lot of accreting matter, then the disk is radiatively efficient and it cools and it is thin. It, uh, many years later, uh, uh, it was proven by um, Narayan and Yi and uh, Marek Abramovich, Abramovich, that if the accretion rate is low, then the flow is radiatively inefficient and it puffs up. And so then at intermediate accretion rates, the standard picture that we all have is that the inner part is hot flow. This is what the people call Corona and the outer part is a thin disk, the inner part of which provides hot, uh, provides electrons, uh, provides photons, soft photons that go into the uh, into the uh, hot medium here, get Comptonized, and out comes the power law spectrum. So nothing wrong with this picture, nothing wrong. It, it certainly happens if you have soft photons produced here, and a hot region nearby. Uh, some photons will escape directly and we observe them. So we see a black body spectrum from the disk, temperature half a kV or so. Um, and, and, and a power loss spectrum, which is interpreted as Comptonization from the hot uh, inner flow. And, so and, perfectly, and I, perfectly acceptable picture. Can I ask you- uh, How hard is the cool? What caused uh, the transition between the thin and the thick disk? What is okay. the process yes. of that? Right. Um, eh, okay, suppose that this is a picture, an instantaneous picture of the flow. Um, then if you increase the accretion rate, then this mat, the density here will become more than before and therefore more efficiently cooling. Therefore, this transition uh, uh, between cool and hot will move inwards. Reversely, if you decrease the accretion rate, then this transition will move outwards because of the inefficiency. So at very low accretion rates, nearly all the flow is hot inner flow. And at very high accretion rates near Eddington, this nearly disappears or disappears completely and the disk reaches the inner stable circular orbit. Wait, so you say that it's a matter of density. So beyond the critical density, if the density is high enough, then the cooling is efficient. And if the density is too low, yes. then it's not efficient? Yes. Uh, yes, this is what I'm saying. Hi. So. Sorry, I have another question. Uh, what is the what is the process responsible for the coupling? Is for it that? actually for the coupling? For the, the coupling between so, the two. Between the, the particles. Yeah, exactly. Is yeah, it, it, it is it is it is uh, 
Only one proposal, it is basically unknown. One proposal that is reasonable is that um, ions, protons from the hot inner flow hit the inner part and puff it up. But there is still something I don't understand. I would imagine that the density increases as you're getting inward, because if it's in the Keplerian uh, velocity, right, then uh, the density, if for a given m dot, right, the density inside is simply a, the same amount of mass for smaller radius. So I think I would expect that the density inside to be large and the density yes. outside to be small. Yes. Uh, okay. As I said, um, it has not been studied. We know we have one proposal by Hank Spruit and collaborators that um, that this the, that this puffing up, this evaporation, let's call it, of the uh, inner part of the disk, comes from bombardment with protons. But um, I. I I uh, declare ignorance on that. I, I say what, um, uh, what is known up to now, but no one has worked. Um, no, no one has really worked on this transition. You know, I, I, still, uh, I still don't see the picture because physically, if I have a constant accretion rate, M dot from, from infinity, right? As the mass gets to smaller and smaller radii, I'm forcing that the density increases, not decreasing. So I, I guess there's something I don't understand here. Um, uh, um, okay. When let's start from a uh, uh, low accretion rate. Okay. No, I think All I sources, accretion rate. Just a second. Just a second, Asaf. Just a second. Yeah. All sources. These black hole X-ray binaries are transient. They spend most of their time in quiescence. That is. Their, uh, their accretion rate is extremely low, so low that the luminosity is undetected. And then um, matter uh, that was stored somewhere away from the black hole uh, in a um, Keplerian orbit via an instability is released and matter falls in. And then you have an outburst. Initially, the accretion rate is low and the flow is inefficient. What do you mean, radiatively inefficient? Huh? You mean radiatively inefficient? Radiatively inefficient. So it has to be in this form. Well, well, no, I don't understand. If it's, if I it's, have a flow, if it's radiatively inefficient, and it's it's constant, it, no it, radiation. It, it, Forget about no radiation, it's inefficient. So you just have a material. You just, uh, I'm thinking in terms of a gas that's circling inward, uh, forming an accretion disk. So the, the inward you get, the denser you get, no? The denser you get, yes. But however, there is, in, in the accretion disk, in the flow, there is a creation of energy due to friction or other mechanisms. Okay. Magnetic, so so energy, energy is generated. And that energy has to go away. And if it cannot go out radially, the, the flow must do something. Just... I think that the momentum transfer that has to occur in the disk in order for mass to travel inwards mm -hmm. directly implies dissipation of energy as well. And if the dissipated energy can leave, then the disk stays thin. If it can't leave, then the, you build up the pressure and the disk pops up. Ah, yes. And so yeah. the question is, can you get rid of the energy or not? But I don't know the, all the details about this. This is not my... Okay, how so the, how hot is the corona? Oh, uh, it it is it is uh, uh, two temperature. The the ions are at equipartition. The electrons are um, uh, ten to the seven, ten to the eight Kelvin. Kelvin. That is uh, hundred kV or so. And how hundred kV? A hundred kV, yes. So this plasma here, the electrons, the, the, electrons, the electrons in the hot inner flow have a temperature of uh, tens of kV to 100 kV. And this the Comptoniz and Comptonization in this produces a power law up to about the temperature of the electrons. So the temperature of the electrons is inferred indirectly where the power law cuts off. And what about the ions? How hot are they? 
Oh, well, uh, ten, two orders of magnitude more. Okay. Okay. So uh, the picture then is that uh, photons, soft photons, one keV or so from here, oops, uh, just a second. Uh, uh, one keV or so from here, either escape directly and we see that as a black body uh, spectrum uh, around one keV or enter the hot inner flow. Get... Can I make a comment? Sorry? Yeah. Can, I, can I make a comment? Of course. Yeah, so this the existence of inner uh, flow, which is uh, deviating from the standard circular snare disk, has always been an observational requirement, and several theoretical models have tried to be built upon that. Uh, one of them is ADAF, that uh, because the advection gets dominated at inner regions, so that it doesn't follow the circular snare. And uh, another that I remember is uh, there's another uh, model, the TCAF. It it says that when the accretion takes place from the uh, uh, companion star. Some matter comes from the winds of the star. That matter is not exactly capillarian, that is a sub capillarian part. When you solve the uh, accretion of that matter, when it comes inside, it pops up and makes this kind of hot corona also. So that is also one of the mechanisms through okay. this corona. Thank you. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this talk to give a full account of, of all that. I mentioned Narayan and Yi who introduced the advection dominated accretion flow, ADAF that you mentioned, and, and independently at the same time, Marek Abramovich. But let's not concentrate on that. Let's take it uh, for granted to proceed. So, okay, uh, I repeat last time, soft photons from here enter here, get up scattered, and we see a power law extended, extending up to the temperature of the hot inner flow about 100 kV or so. Okay. Um, now, regarding timing, the uh, strong belief number two says the following. The time lag of the hard X-ray photons with respect to the softer ones, okay, hard consider, for example, um, uh, 10 to 20 kV, and soft consider uh, three to five or something like that. Uh, the time lag of the hard photons with respect to softer ones is caused by propagating fluctuations in the accretion flow. We observe time lags of order of tens of milliseconds between hard X-ray photons and softer ones. And the standard picture says the following, uh, back to the schematic, says that um, um, the, in the accretion flow, there are fluctuations which propagate inwards. And if the hot inner flow has a temperature gradient, that is, it is hotter here than out here, then first you see soft photons by Comptonization, and later on you see harder photons. Okay, that's the picture. And I also like this idea too. Uh, I, I why, do always, like why do you always see the, the hard photons lagging behind? If you have fluctuations, then okay. that means that you can also see it vice versa, no? No, no, the, 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 okay, let's go back. Uh, the, the fluctuations, okay, suppose you'd create a fluctuation here. Yes, that fluctuation may proceed backwards and forward, but this part here is invisible because it's in, it's, it's, in, it's in the UV. If this is soft X-rays, the inner part of the disk, the, as you go out, the temperature falls and, and therefore it's non-observable. So you're assuming that the fluctuations are always at the edge between the- No, thick... no, no, anywhere, anywhere. So you- oh, You have the fluctuation in the- Okay. In the inner parts of the thick disk, close to the horizon, then uh, this will affect the hot, the, the hard X-rays first, no? Yes. Okay. This picture puts the fluctuations at that distance from the black hole as it is needed to explain the, um, the, the, the delay. So it's put in by hand. 
isn't the key that fluctuations, if they propagate, they should propagate from the outside to the inside. And that means up in energy, up yeah, in temperature it, and up in energy. That, that's that's the, the standard propagate. assumption, but- They don't but, propagate uh, inside to outside, yeah. Well, the, second. This, is the, this is what people assume, but where they put the, uh, the, the source of the fluctuations and um, uh, what temperature gradient they take here and so on, it's, it's all put in by hand. There is no physics. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Um, so I like it very much. And I think it certainly happens. Uh, yeah. the, the, the flow can certainly, will certainly have fluctuations. Uh, therefore, and they will propagate and therefore they will introduce lags and so on. But there is a but. The two mechanisms, <clears throat> Comptonization in the hot inner flow and propagating fluctuations for the time lags do not talk to each other. In other words, no correlation is expected between the time lag of the hard photons with respect to the softer ones and the power loss spectral index gamma. And the reason is that gamma is determined from the temperature and the optical depth of the hot inner flow of the corona, while T lag is determined from the flow time scale, the place where the fluctuation started and the temperature gradient of the inner flow. So the two are totally different. They don't talk to each other. I want to, I want to say something about these fluctuations again. The fluctuations can in principle propagate backward because they would propagate at the speed of sound so as long as the speed of sound, uh, as long as the Keplerian velocity or the inflow velocity is less than the speed of sound, the uh, propagations would would uh, propagate backwards. Uh, it, it, right. it, it, it is less than the speed of sound. It is. Yeah. So there is no restriction. So that means that the propagations can propagate both inward and outward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but but the outward ones cannot be seen unless they are created in the corona, and then then uh, yes. Yeah, they can be created the corona. I don't see any. Really, you did not specify um, what, uh, what is the mechanism for this fluctuation, so they can be created. Of anyway. course, no, no, no. And I will not because this is not uh, uh, my cup of tea, nor I work on it. Therefore, I will leave it as such. Um, uh, but keep in mind this last paragraph here. The the spectrum that is the power law index and the time lag between hard photons and soft photons are produced by two mechanisms. They are separate and then the, the mechanisms do not talk to each other. So you said that the time lag depends on the size of the hot part of the equation disk, right? On the hot equation disk. The, right. the time lag, the size depends on the, on the time that it took for the fluctuations to proceed from the cooler part of the corona to the hotter part of the corona. Right, but they, they would propagate at the speed of sound, so this is roughly constant. So the real time lag would be, the, 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 what determines the time lag should be the actual size, the physical size of the hot. Okay, the yes. And um, the gamma is but, depending on the, on the temperature essentially, right? Okay, but let, let's, not, let's not spend too much time on it because it's dead, okay? Uh, the, the gamma and T lag, gamma and T lag, should not be correlated, okay? However, the two are correlated. And a nice correlation that I will show you in the next slide was found by Pablo and me in GX339-4, which is the best studied black hole X-ray binary. Here it is, T lag in seconds. So you see it's 30 milliseconds maximum here, starts from 10 milliseconds or less and goes there. And this is gamma, the power law index. The blue points are the data, the observations that Pablo analyzed. And you see that you have a nice correlation. So it's, a li it's, it's uh, almost linear. Uh, up to here, and then it changes to nonlinear and does all that. 
and the uh, uh, axes are our models that I will describe. Um, the in the in the uh, so-called um, uh, beginning of the hard state, the hard state, and the intermediate hard intermediate state. Okay. Can, can so, I just ask? I know I know that gamma is the photon uh, index. index, but it, it is it defined with a plus or a minus sign. That if if gamma is large, is that a softer spectrum? It's a softer spectrum. It's e. Right. Remember, it's uh, the the number of photons per unit energy dn by de is proportional to e to the minus gamma. Thanks. So the minus is put in explicitly. So gamma in our community uh, is positive always. Okay. So uh, uh, I will come. I, I will not uh, tell you now how we got these x's, uh, but you see that we did. Okay. Okay, so let's come to this correlation. We have explained this correlation by uh, assuming that comptonization takes place in the corona and in the jet. This time lag then is due to the random process, the random walk of the photons in the comptonization process. In, a, in other words, uh, okay, the, the parameters that we varied uh, let me go back a little. So, Comptonization in the jet it, in, uh, uh, produces time lags for the following reason. Um, the jet is also hot like the corona and uh, the more times a photon scatters, the um, more energy it gains, but at the same time it is delayed because it has done a random walk in order to acquire this energy. So photons that scatter once or twice um, have a small delay. Uh, photons that have 30, uh, 20 to 30 keV energy have scattered more times, therefore come later. Right, so, so now you're basically changing the paradigm, right? Because so far you discussed about the time lag as due to uh, motion inside the accretion disk. And the uh, gamma is due to scattering from the uh, outer parts of the hot disk. And now you're saying that actually the time, the light comes from the, the photons originate from the jet. Now I am saying that, why don't we look, this is how Pablo and I thought. Uh, uh, and this is many years ago. Our first paper was in 2003. Uh, of course, nobody paid attention to, to, to it uh, until now. Uh, but they will at some point. Um, we said, uh, look, Comptonization is inevitable. The power law is explained by Comptonization. If you want to correlate that with uh, gamma, you need the same mechanism to produce the, 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 the time lags. And it does naturally. Upscattering of photons, if you take soft photons and upscatter them in energy, you delay them with respect to the unscattered ones or to the few times scattered ones. So the same mechanism produces both gamma and the time lag. Why, no, why no, surprise then, no surprise then that they are correlated. Why would this not also occur in the corona? You have a similar Comptonization process where photons need to scatter more times to get more energy. Uh, uh, um, Yes, can, can I postpone answering that for a little? Because there is another uh, observation that opposes that. I can ask the, kind of the similar question from a different direction, which is what, do you, do you need the disk at all in this? Uh, 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 in, this in, in principle, Asaf, no. Um, my uh, former student, Dimitrios Yanios, uh, 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 examined whether synchrotron from the same source uh, can be the source of soft photons. Um, and he found that, yes, it can be, although it's, it's, a, uh, it, 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 it's a weak contribution from synchrotron upscattering. Okay. 
So basically, you don't need a disk here at all. With what you say in, prin in principle, in principle, no. But then you have to explain the soft part of the spectrum. And in X-ray, to launch the jet as well, maybe you need it. You need Sasaf to explain the the bump that you observe around one kV, and that cannot come from synchrotron. Okay, let's let's proceed. Um, uh, what we uh, did is, uh, as I said, studied um, uh, Compton upscattering in the jet, and the parameters that we varied are the two natural ones, the size of the jet and its optical depth. And one may say that uh, with two parameters you can fit an elephant. Correct, but the two parameters are correlated. We found for this source that the optical depth and the size of the jet are correlated. So it's basically one parameter. What do you mean by the size of the jet? The size of the jet, if you have a parabolic jet uh, where the radius, where the radius is at height z is proportional to z to the one half, uh, okay, then uh, you, 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 the shape is the of the of the of the jet is determined by its radius at the at its base. Okay, so you're assuming it's a parabola. So this is a strong assumption. That the jet. No, 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 no. It's an observational fact. Well, all jets that we have resolved are parabolic. No. Yes. M87 is not parabolic. Okay, uh, show me uh, a reference with a non-parabolic jet, not theoretical paper. M87. An observation, huh? M87. M87 is parabolic at its base. Oh. Ah, at its base, yeah. Of but course. Then it's, yeah, but then of the course, of out. course. No, I, I, I don't care what happens uh, uh, light years away. Oh, uh, let's, okay, fine. Yes. Okay. Where, where the Comptonization occurs. Okay. Further out, yet you have only radio emission and all hell breaks loose with interaction with the medium and so on is, is irrelevant for this work. Anyway, um, generally in our community, it is assumed that the jets are like fire fireworks, beautiful, but useless. And I will try to convince you that this is totally wrong. Jets, jets appear to, to play a very important role in the observed phenomena in black hole X-ray binaries. And in the next slide, we will look again at the schematic of the accretion flow. And, and another thing that it is generally accepted that the jet is fed from the hot inner flow. And I will assume it also here. And I say in passing that winds come from the outer part, from the thin disk, the Shakura Sunyayev disk. We have seen simultaneously jets and winds from X-ray binaries, and that justifies the schematic of a hot inner flow and, a, and an outer uh, Shakura Sunyayev disk. So jets are fed from the uh, hot inner flow, and I go to the next schematic. Here so it is. Do you see anything directly uh, from the inner flow itself or just indirectly via the production of jets? Indirectly. So uh, in, in your model, you, you see nothing from the, from the hot inner flow? No, no, no. OK. Uh, all we know is that when the accretion rate increases and this transition radius moves inward and at near Eddington or so, the, it comes to the ISCO, then the, the hot inner flow, the hot inner flow uh, disappears and the jet disappears. That is true. So when the hot inner flow disappears, the jet disappears. Then on the return path of the, as the, uh, so the, the accretion rate reaches a maximum and then at some point begins to fall. And when it falls, we infer the production of a hot inner flow because a jet is beginning to form and then we see it as a compact jet. So it, 
this picture seems quite robust. What I want you to notice is that if the jet is fed from the hot inner flow, there is no boundary between the two. This line here does not exist. The lower part of the jet and the upper part of the hot inner flow is the same thing. So if a soft photon comes here and travels in here, it has to leave and it may leave, but most of the time, because the jet is engulfing the hot inner flow, it will enter the jet and scatter here also. No, no, it's uh, the definition of jet, you know, is material that has enough kinetic energy to, you know, flow to infinity, right? Uh, if, uh, if you give a material, if you give a piece of material kinetic energy, but not enough to fall into infinity, then we call it a wind, right? It will go out, but then it will certainly, uh, uh, eventually it will fall down back in the gravitational potential of the black hole. So the definition is, uh, it's a well, you don't have to use this definition, but if you do, then it's a well-defined what is a jet and what is not a jet. Fine. I, I, I have no objection to that. The jet has matter in it. Yeah. And it's probably protons and electrons. Yeah. So uh, depending on, 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 the, uh, 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 on the radio that you see here, you can estimate the density. And the density is such that the optical depth to Thomson scattering is moderate. So scatterings can take place in the jet. That's okay, that's no problem. That's okay, that's what I said also. Okay, inference number one. The base of the jet, I said it already, the base of the jet engulfs the hot inner flow. Thus, Comptonization in the jet is unavoidable. In other words, most of the photons that enter the hot inner flow cannot escape without traveling through the jet and being scattered there also. In the scattering process, the photons forget their previous history. After a scattering or two, the photon forgets what its, initial, what its initial energy and direction uh, were. So uh, after a few scatterings in the jet, the photons forget their previous history and forget whether they were scattered in the um, um, hot inner flow. So several scatterings in the jet determine the spectrum. In other words, the jet and Comptonization in it, is it, in it fixes the observed index gamma, independent of what happened in the hot inner flow. I, I don't understand why, why the last scattering determines the spectrum. It's not gradual. the last, not not the last scattering, the last scatterings. Uh, not the last scattering. Right. There's... I mean, you can compute how many scatterings you need to go from the initial energy to whatever to the yes. temperature. Yes. 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 I, I I agree. Yes. It's yeah. uh, I should quantify it. Yes. Uh, if the power law uh, is produced with ten scatterings, then you need to have at least half of them, if not more, in the jet. I mean, the jet is optically thick. If, it, if the jet is optically thick, most photons would have a hard time entering. I mean, half would. No, 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 no. It's uh, uh, the, the optical depth that I will discuss, that I have already mentioned and I will uh, uh, discuss again, is the optical depth along the jet. This, of course, uh, uh, fixes the optical depth. If you give me the velocity, it fixes the optical depth perpendicular to the jet. But uh, this oh, optical really? depth is, yeah. is moderate. And therefore, yes, indeed, in the lower part of the jet, you have, uh, quite a, uh, you have quite a few scatterings. And the lower part of the jet is the same as the hot inner flow. The two cannot be separated. Uh, uh, and further up in the jet, you have fewer uh, because the optical depth there is uh, smaller, of order one. Okay, inference number so you, two. What are you assuming about the distribution of um, 
energies of the particles inside the jet? Is it the power law or is it the thermal? Yes, uh, it does not matter. Uh, we have proven, or uh, not with Pablo, but with a, a, a student, that um, the radio spectrum, uh, as you know that, you've, you've published papers on that, uh, uh, the radio spectrum is more or less the same whether you assume a power law distribution of electrons or a thermal distribution of electrons. So really what determines the power law is just the number of scatterings that a single photon will undergo. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it's, it's unsaturated Comptonization. It's unsaturated Comptonization, so, correct. So, then, so the power law is determined by the Y parameter, which you could yes, define as- absolutely. Scatterings times the temperature. Yes, that's and why I said that gamma is determined from the temperature of the plasma that does the scattering and the optical depth. Yes, I I never under I I don't know this field very well. So, but I never understood why. It seems that you always observe unsaturated Comptonization. I mean, y parameter is always comparable to one, not much larger, not much smaller, and that to me implies that there, for some reason, the optical depth and the temperature knows about each other. Uh, uh, probably it's a good uh, remark. Um, the hot in, the, the hot inner flow. Uh, is uh, in, in whatever calculations have been done uh, that I mentioned, ADAF calculations mm -hmm. that I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the, the corona has an, an optical depth of order unity. And so does the jet. The, the optical depth in the jet is moderate to explain the observations. Are, are the temperatures also always slightly less than the electron rest mass? Oh, much less. But, well, I mean, how much less? Oh, well, I said le uh, less than uh, uh, 100 kV, therefore, and that's much less than 500. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so in, in calculations, um, you need to take uh, uh, Klein-Nishina uh, uh, corrections to the cross-section, but that's about all. Yeah, it, to me, it just feels like there's pairs going on here. For some reason, I don't know. Hey, that's just a remark. You don't have to know. It's, it's okay. Asaf, Asaf, Asaf. This is an unsolved uh, question. Um, you, the, the jet. I, I don't mind if the jet is uh, uh, has uh, electron-positron pairs or uh, electron-proton pairs. Um, uh, I, as long as I have electrons, I can do it, and. You may have pairs, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, the inference number two is that Comptonization in the in the jet in the jet fixes not only gamma but also T lag. I said that already. On average, the photons gain energy with every scattering. Thus, the harder photons have scattered more times than the softer ones. This means that the harder photons have spent more time in their random walk than the softer ones. And this automatically implies that the harder photons are delayed with respect to the softer ones. No surprise then that the same mechanism, uh, 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 since the same mechanism produces both, it's no surprise that T lag and gamma are correlated. <coughs> now, you may say the correlation that I showed you and which I did not explain physically, but I left that. I have view graphs ready uh, to explain things at the end. So um, let's proceed with the with the uh, with this, and and I'll we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, if it's okay, Asaf, we can proceed until one. You can proceed as long as you want. There's no limit. All right. Okay. Fine. Okay. We'll get to the end of it, as, and I'm happy that there are so many uh, questions because it, it means people follow my talk. Now, I showed you one correlation for GX339 minus four between T lag and gamma. Could this correlation be just a peculiarity of GX339 minus four? No, all sources do more or less the same. And 
Here we put all the sources, Pablo and I and others, uh, we put all the sources on this plot. Um, have, you I kind have... of wait, wait, Asaf. I have. I will. I will tell the story, not you. Uh, the, the the funny story that is. Um, okay, you kind of see that there is some trend towards this black line, and formally this correlation is acceptable. And the funny story that I prevented Asaf from commenting on is the following. When I presented this graph in a conference uh, in France, I think it was 2018, Asaf being polite did not say anything during my talk, but in the end he came to me and said, my friend, I'm not convinced with this. Um, I tried to imitate his voice also. My friend, I cannot, I'm not convinced with this correlation. Because if you take that point away, then I can hardly see a correlation. Uh, I said, uh, you're, you're right, but I know that this correlation is okay because when I plot each source separately, I see a line. The line is different in one case, different than the other, different than the other, but when you put them all together, you get something like that. So, but it had Pablo and I, uh, uh, it, it had us uh, worried uh, why there is so much scatter here. So Pablo did the following. He grouped these sources into two categories. Those with low inclination, in other words, we see the accretion disk nearly edge on, and those with high inclination, we see the disk nearly face on. And the result is this. The low inclination sources do this, the high inclination sources do that, and you see that all in between are in here. So if you put all in between, you get the previous plot. Look at it and look at here. So inclination plays a role. What's oh, your definition of low versus high inclinations here? Say it again. What is your definition of low inclination? Ah, okay. Uh, inclination say uh, above uh, 60, you call it uh, high and inclination below 30, you call it low. Something like that. Pablo, am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, roughly speaking, I yeah, I have to we have to look at the paper to see exactly how we defined it, how Pablo defined it. But uh, inclination, inclination with respect to the jet angle, jet axis, is it? With yes, we assume that the jet is perpendicular to the disk. And these are just two sources, or you see you're showing more sources. These are true black hole X-ray binaries. No, no, the one, the one you showed previously, uh, the following, the next slide. Yes. Is it like one source with high inclination, one source with low inclination? No, 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 no. All the all the high inclination and all the low inclination, okay, and so in between here would be the intermediate inclination. We published that later on. I will not discuss it today. But this is data. It's not simulation. This is data. This oh, is data. How do you know the inclination? Sorry? How do you know the inclination? Uh, people infer it uh, in various ways. If you see eclipses, uh, then it's uh, high inclination. Uh, I, I, yeah, don't ask me. Pablo can probably answer that, but uh, I, I cannot tell you how observers do that. We just take the public. It has to do with uh, there are winds, uh, the day detect winds. Okay. So the type of situation. All right. So um, we take the published values and we use them and we get that. Uh, um, uh, and all intermediate inclination sources are falling here. It's published. I will not discuss it. So this result has not been explained by the standard picture. 
the hot inner flow being more or less spherical produces isotropic spectra. So here is the answer to your questions, uh, David, to your question, David, that the hot inner flow cannot produce an isotropic spectra. And now we will see how the jet can produce an isotropic spectra. Uh, an isotropic in the following sense, the harder photons are in the forward direction and the softer photons are in the backward one and in, in between spectra are in the perpendicular direction. So from forward hard going to backward, the spectrum softens. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Why do you say the hot inner flow is a spherical? Because a spherical object which is rotating, it will always fall into the geometry like a torus kind of. It, it, is, it is nearly spherical. It is, I said, being more or less spherical in the sense that it, it has a scale height which is much larger uh, than the radius. This is the definition of a thick disk. Therefore, it, it more or less engulfs the, um, the, the, the black hole. That's why I called it more or less spherical. It's not spherical. So some, some anisotropy uh, exists, but minute, not this big. Uh, I have another question. What is the typical densities of material in the jet? The physical densities, I cannot, I, I do not know offhand, but um, let's say uh, we can estimate it quickly. Um, for a radius uh, of uh, say uh, 100 RG, 100 RG, and RG is, is uh, say, an, an R, and RG is, is about 10 kilometers. So it's like uh, a thousand kilometers, 10 to the nine, 10 to the eight. And uh, Thomson depth and density give you a border a few. So calculate it. I cannot do it right now. Okay. So rate, scale length of 10 to the eight, uh, 10 to the nine. Um, 17, okay. to be quite high. Thomson, yes, it's quite high. Yes. Okay. And do you have any estimates? Are there any estimates of the densities in the disk, in the inner parts of the disk? Oh, much higher than this. Uh, uh, not in the not in the not in the hot inner flow. Not in the hot inner flow, but in the in the Sakura Srinayak, this much higher, of course. Okay. And Sakura okay. is generally minus two or minus three grams per cc. Generally. In the disk. Yeah. Ah, okay. Depends on accretion rate. If you consider two uh, Eddington, one or two accretion rate. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Then, then 10 to 22. You need to get something like 10 to the 17 yes. uh, particles per CC, right, to explain this uh, 10 milliseconds time delay that you're seeing. Okay. 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 Now I will convince you that. Uh, even in a spherical cloud, you can produce an isotropic spectra, but I'll tell you how. So, and then I will proceed to, to convince you that a jet always produces uh, an isotropic spectra. So here I have considered a, a spherical cloud of temperature T and optical depth tau, uh, say a few, let's say three to, four or something like that. If, and a point source at the center, if the source emits isotropically, then the spectra will be isotropic also because spherical symmetry is preserved. However, if you emit the photons in one direction, then this spherical symmetry is broken as follows. All photons then start from the center and move one mean free path away. And there they scatter essentially by Thomson scattering essentially isotropically. So a, a point source that emit directed radiation, one mean free path, optical depth equal to one above that becomes a source, an isotropic source. 
So now these photons, these isotropic photons, see an optical depth tau minus one to the front, tau plus one to the back. Oh, they see different optical depths. Therefore, they will scatter a different number of times and therefore the spectra will be uh, um, anisotropic. Let's consider now the point source outside that, which is the case of the jet. At the base of the jet, imagine that this is the jet. At the base of the jet or in this sphere, you have photons coming in. They go one mean free path away, that is optical depth equal to one. And then scatter, uh, there they scatter uh, uh, isotropically and then the photons that go in this direction, more or less, see an optical depth two tau minus one, and the ones that go backward see an optical depth of one. Huge difference. Clearly, the photons that manage to go up and get out this way will have scattered more times and therefore will have gained more energy and therefore the spectrum will be harder. So harder spectrum is expected from the jet uh, in the forward direction. And as you go to the backward direction, you expect the spectrum to soften. This is true only as long as tau is not too big. And yes. the photons are much less energetic than the electrons. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. It's satisfied. And I said from the beginning, uh, optical depths moderate. All right. Hi, it's clear. Um, now, uh, are there any other successes of the JET model? Um, I think I have convinced you that the T-lag gamma correlation is quite stringent. And I also hope I, for, I have convinced you that it is explained naturally with it, the JET model. Can, can I ask one question about, if you don't mind? Of course not. Yeah, can you? So there, there was a, I mean, typical T lag seems to be, what was it? 0, 0.0 and a few Three. seconds. Can, 30 milliseconds, yes. 30 milliseconds. Can you, can you resolve the hard spectrum during this time? The spectral, the Comptonized spectrum. Can you resolve if it, if it I mean, how the spectrum changes during this time? The time Since, evolution. Uh, in, in, in my Monte Carlo code, yes. In no, I, no, I mean, I mean observations now. No, 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 we don't. Because we have a detector and that detector detects photons. Uh -huh. You but don't I, know, all, all you have a detector that detects photons and a timer that says when they came. And you see that the harder photons come later than the softer ones. So but, you see, but you don't. Yeah, you you simply don't get enough photons to resolve no, what happens. No, 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 no. Okay. okay so uh, this was fine, but again, it's just one thing. Are there any other observational constraints that the jet model explains? And the answer is yes. Yes. Else, I would not ask the question. So I will mention a couple. There are more, and they are all published. So. If anyone is interested, can look at them. I, I have prepared slides at the end if there are questions. But um, so it's not just the couple that I will mention. But there I are have, more. I have a question for you. Yes. Is um, time lag, the gamma correlation, they are still over some states right now. How, how large is the, uh, you know, how big difference are the different states? Uh, in terms of accretion rates in which this correlation is observed. Okay. Can I tell uh, you what I ask? Yes. Uh, in, the, in the, in the, in the, I, I don't want to go back. I don't want to lose time. In the correlation that I showed you for GX339 minus four, which is the best studied, uh, we start from uh, luminosities uh, uh, very low, 10 to the 35, 10 to the 36, and go. Uh, all the way up as long as a power law is seen. Therefore, uh, in you, 
uh, Asaf know about it. In the Q diagram, you, st you start from the bottom right corner and you go up, turn over, and you, you go up until the jet nearly disappears. So it's a wide range of luminosities. Yeah, okay, I think this can cause a trouble here because I think that in order for your model to work, that's kind of coincide with what Christopher asked you earlier. He uh, had a very, very, very interesting comment. Uh, because I think that uh, you are pretty much restricted to optical depths of a few inside the jet. The opti if the optical depth is, is less than that or more than a few tens, then, um, then it's not gonna work what you're proposing. Uh, but in order to get an optical depth of a few, that means that the density in the jet cannot be cannot be that different in between these two in in between the you know the different states of the system. Okay, uh, uh, I don't see that as a criticism or anything. The optical depths that we used uh, to explain GX thirty nine minus four range from uh, two. To ten, yeah. If, it, if you're as long as you stay with that, then that, that's okay. No, no, no. No I, I explain the observations and the correlation with these optical depths. What else can I do? No, but this means that uh, the density of material in the jet is uh, is nearly constant, regardless of the accretion rate. So you're changing the accretion no, rate. No, 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 no. It's not. An order of magnitude change is not constant. Optical depth from one to ten is not is not constant. The density okay. is not constant. Okay, so let's say that the density in the jet changes by an order of magnitude, while the density in the disk changes by several orders of magnitude. The accretion rate in the disk changes by several orders of magnitude. Yes. Uh, and the, the density in the jet only changes by one order of magnitude. Okay. So there is something that regulates that. Yeah, the the the, 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 the process by which the jet is ejected from the hot inner flow. Yes. Okay. Well, that's a consequence of what you say. Uh, uh, what else can I say? I, I say that uh, the jet is fed from the hot inner flow. So there is a mechanism there that ejects matter uh, from the hot inner flow. It's probably the magnetic field. Um, and that's, this process then determines how much matter will go up. All I'm saying is that if the optical depth in the jet is in this range, I can explain the observations. I do not produce a jet. You will do that, or, or your students and I will do that, and you. <laughs> it would be very interesting to know why nature conspires in such a way that- I know, yes. Parameters is, is yes, I, yes. There must be some connection with uh, what, what sets the electron temperature and, and, uh, and the density? The, the electron uh, 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 is the virial temperature in the hot inner flow for the ions. And the electrons, um, uh, because of cooling, uh, keep a lower temperature. Um, uh, so you have a hot, hot plasma. And out of this plasma comes the jet. So radiation, I, is, if it's due to cooling, then radiation is setting essentially setting the temperature of the electrons. Uh, in the hot inner flow, yes. What else? I mean, uh, some balance between dissipation and and yes, yes, yes. yeah. Yes. Oh. And and uh, the energy is in the ions. The energy is in the ions, and and the ions yes. feed the electrons, and the electrons lose energy. Right. And so okay. then you could. I mean, it, it seems easy for for me at least to envision uh, a case where tau where the y parameter is way larger than unity or way smaller than unity. I mean, unless there is some mechanism to keep it close to unity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but I, this, is not, this is not your model specifically, I mean. No, 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 yes. certainly not. And I'm not able to do that. Yes, yes. I am not able to do such calculations. So, right, right. Uh, Asaf and he, with he, the work that he has already done on jets and the one that he plans to do with his students could possibly address that, right, uh, Asaf? Partially. Well, partially. It's something right. you can do, but uh, not, not everything. Okay, fine. But anyway, 
it, it does not belong to me uh, or to this talk. So we keep it as a remark and an interesting thing to, uh, to have in mind for the future. So, okay, let's now mention other successes of the JET model. It has been observed from 2000 by Potsmith et al in Cygnus X1 that the time lag, the same time lag that we've been talking, the numbers here are cut, so, but this is 10, 10 uh, milliseconds. The time lag is not constant, but it is a power law of Fourier frequency. In other words, the variability at high frequencies exhibit a smaller time lag than the variabilities in low frequency. This is something that needs to be explained. And we have explained it. And we have, so this power law, this power law is new to the minus 0 0.7. With I'm, our... I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I'm slightly confused. So wasn't the time lag larger at for this is different source. Uh different and also you said for right. Oh, I'm I'm confusing things, I think. It was for harder power laws, you had a larger time lag, not for higher frequencies. Uh, just a second. This is okay. totally different. If you want to talk about the old ones, uh, the typical the typical time lag is is 10 or tens of milliseconds. And this is Cygnus X1, which I have not discussed before. And it's a different correlation. It's a correlation of the time lag between hard photons and soft photons as a function of frequency in the Fourier spectrum, that is. What about frequency of what exactly? Fourier frequency. You take the Fourier, uh, uh, the Fourier, um, the, the, you, you take the, uh, you take the two bands, the soft and the hard. Okay. And you take their Fourier transform. So okay. The one then thing. conjugate conjugate one of the two and multiply them. Then uh, the, the, there is a phase difference between that is produced between the two. Okay. And, oh, and, and this phase difference is a function of Fourier frequency. So phase function, the phase is two pi uh, nu times t. And therefore phase lag and, and time lag are proportional to each other. So physically speaking, do you mean that high frequency means the fast variability and low frequency means uh, slow variability? This, this is an observational fact. It says, and it needs an explanation. It says that isn't when you see the, the, the Fourier frequency that exhibits, uh, that, 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 that has the highest frequency, say 10 Hertz, exhibits two orders of magnitude less time lag than the 0.1 Hertz. But, but isn't that just uh, the same thing? I, I, it seems that I'm not surprised that you get the slope of a minus one here. It's not minus one, it's minus 0.7. Okay. Minus, it's minus 0.7. I'm still trying to understand what you're doing here. So you, you have, you, you're taking the, the 1 kV, right? And the 10 kV, right? The high and soft. Yes. The, and yes. and then there, there is a time lag, which means that- um, so, you, so you have, you have, uh, you have the intensity as a function of time, I soft yeah, yeah. of T, and you have I hard of T. Yeah. From your two detectors. And then take the Fourier transform of both of them. So yeah, okay. you get I1, I soft, I soft tilde and I hard tilde. These are functions now of Fourier frequency. Yeah. Take the conjugate of one. So the phase now changes sign and multiply it with the other one. So you get in the ex exponent phi soft minus phi hard. Mm -hmm. and call that phi and call it phase difference between the two. That phase difference is two pi nu, the frequency you're talking uh, about, 
times T lag at that frequency. So basically what you say that when you have a very quick fluctuations, right, very small fluctuations, the time lag is much less than when you have a longer fluctuations. Essentially that's what it's, it's shown here. It, uh, okay, see, view it this way. Uh, I don't mind how you want to view it, but, but keep in mind that if some, I, because uh, uh, I hope that later on you will ask me to give you a, a physical explanation of this. Now I only state that we um, uh, reproduced it exactly new to the minus 0.7 with our jet model. I will explain how this happens and why with the jet, uh, but not now. I want to proceed. Okay. Okay. Now, um, um, Altamirano and Mendes in 2015 observed this particular source, GX39 minus four, the known, the well-known one, as a function of time, and measured the cutoff energy. Uh, let's say the temperature of the Comptonizing plasma and the phase lag, which is proportional to time lag, as I discussed. And this, these two were constant for some time. And then the cutoff energy decided to uh, decrease from 120 to go down to 60. And the phase lag increased and therefore the time lag increased. Now you see that the two are correlated and notice 2015, as soon as we saw the preprint, Pablo and I said, why don't we just use the results that we already have? And indeed using the results we already had, we explained it very nicely. What is this? Sorry? What is this P equal to zero and P equals 0 0.5? Uh, okay. Um, the, the, the P equals zero means that the jet has no acceleration region and P equal 0.5 means as it is uh, natural, a small acceleration uh, region um, at the bottom. Yeah. Can I ask you how you do your computations? Monte Carlo. And and with and what assumptions? I mean, how is the jet? You said there was an acceleration. Okay, we have a a, a parabolic jet, uh -huh. uh, where we uh, fix, let's say, the density at its base, and that fixes the optical depth along the jet, uh, uh, and the the size of the jet at its base, the radius R not, and a constant temperature. Uh, Constant temperature, yes. Um, and inject photons at the base. And inject photons at the at the bottom and let them do whatever they like. So what is EC? This is the cutoff frequency? The cutoff frequency, the cutoff energy in the spectrum. Go down to 60? Okay. Yes, it's going down from 120 or so, 130, it goes down to 60. And at the same time, the phase lag, which is proportional to time lag, increases. How do you, how do you model things like lag? I mean, do you have impulsive injection of photons? Yes, we, 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 we have a delta function injection of the photons. And then along their travel, in their random walk, we compute the distance traveled divided by C and add it every time. And therefore, we know how much time each photon spent. So we get the uh, intensity as a function of time and energy. Then we do exactly what the observers do. We take two bands, the soft and the hard, take the Fourier transform, and do all that. Then you're also assuming that you start with some monoenergetic photons. No, these are not monoenergetic photons. These are black body photons at temperature uh, or the temperature of the disk. Which is, okay. Uh, and uh, what it's a, it's half, half, a KV, half a KV. So what, what is the, the parameter that you change here is just the temperature of the electrons in the jet? Uh, 
basically, these are the two the two parameters. Yes. No, you have the so so you have a Monte Carlo simulation. So you start with photons, which you inject as a delta function in time and with a given temperature. And then the difference between the, the different ones is just the temperature of the electrons in the inside the inside the jet. Or is there anything else that they change? Uh, 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 I, I, I did not, I missed you, Asaf, Can you, could you please repeat? Yeah, I just ask, what is the difference between the different runs that you make? Yeah. The things that you change is just the temperature of the electrons inside the jet, or is there anything else that you change? No, uh, uh, for this calculation, yes, the temperature of the electrons and the, uh, uh, the density or the size, I don't remember. Uh, I mean, optical depth, effectively, I guess. Yeah, the same thing. Density and optical depth are the same. But then how do you correlate the temperature of the electrons with the density? We don't correlate. We, they are probably uh, we are sure it's a parameter. If it's a parameter, then you should get the full space, right? I mean, it's uh... Sorry? You can have, you can change the density while keeping the energy. That's going to change the lag. Right? In order to change the lag, you have to change the density. Yes, and in order to change the energy, the cutoff energy. The, the, the cutoff energy comes from the from the Comptonization process. Ah, no, not from the well. Oh no no no! If you the, the turnover is uh, uh, is. It, it, is different as uh, depending on the number of scatterings that you had. Oh, so what is the what is the energy of the electrons in the jet that you're assuming? Uh, I cannot remember now. We have to look at the paper. Uh, probably what, Pablo what, doesn't remember, but but um, I don't care about the exact value. I think the thing that I'm more interested in is you have to take a very different energy for the electrons in the jet and in the disk. In the in the disk. Yeah, in the inner parts of the of the disk, they might, they have to be much colder than the temperature of the electrons inside the jet. Right. Otherwise, there would be no Comptonization. So yes, I mean. So what is the ratio of temperatures that you, if you happen to remember? What's the ratio of temperatures that you take uh, between the temperature of the electrons in the disk and in the jet? Uh, no, I, 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 cannot, I, I, I cannot remember. Yes, I cannot remember. It, okay. This uh, let's it's a technical question. Let's uh, I'll, I'll give you information as of uh, later on by email. If, if 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 this does not prevent you from understanding uh, things further down, then uh, let's leave it at this time. Okay, since I, I don't have uh, I need to look at, at the paper. I need to to see what we varied to get this line and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tell you exactly. Okay. Okay. Delta. Delta function injection is justified. The disk continuously injects photons into the jet. We inject all the photons at the same time, t equals zero, in order to compute at what time they come out. And the Fourier transform of this uh, intensity in one energy band and the other determines the phase, dif the phase lag. Okay, I'll proceed. Um, let's, wow, what a, nice, what a short introduction, one hour and a half. Okay, let's now go to the, to the recent paper. Huh? That was the introduction part. That was the introduction part. Let's go to the recent paper, but that's only four view graphs. So it, it will be done quickly. Um, I hope that I have convinced you that the jet is not a firework emitting radio waves. It seems to play a major role in the observed phenomenon. And thus I will discuss how the jet illuminates the accretion disk. Um, as we discussed, as I said earlier, photons enter the jet and get scattered and some of them go high up in the jet, others are es escape the jet uh, lower down, but the photons escape from different heights of the um, uh, of the jet, and we want to look at the photons that 
hit the disk. So this is the paper. We what consider, is, yes? What is the low end spy? Is it relativistic, Jeff? It's mildly relativistic. Uh, the, uh, the V parallel is, is typically uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 C. Oh, okay, so it's not, it's not highly relativistic. No, 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 it's not. Yeah, I, I will discuss uh, uh, how uh, things are affected if you make the jet more relativistic than, than uh, we typically have. Uh, gamma Lorentz for the jet, uh, for the flow in black hole X-ray binaries is typically around one and a half to two. Okay, we consider a parabolic jet as is observed with base radius R naught. We consider a steep power law distribution of electrons. Uh, thus, most of the electrons have the minimum Lorentz factor, which is which we call it here, gamma naught. And the optical depth parallel to the jet is moderate. So these are the three parameters that we play with in this paper. Are, sorry, th these are electrons in the jet then? These they're are electro electrons uh, in the jet, yes. Oh, they're, okay, so they're not thermal. Uh, they they could be, and the result is, is, is it will the, be same. Roughly the same. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yes, it does not affect things at all. Right. Okay, first of all, we run a calculation. I don't remember the parameters um, of optical depth, uh, uh, gamma naught, and uh, they are in the paper. I can uh, give them to you. Okay. Um, Tau parallel is three, radius is 80 RG, and gamma naught is 2.24, reasonable values. Mm -hmm. And we calculate the uh, spectrum that an observer sees. The observer is at, um, at angle with respect to the jet equal to 60 degrees, plus minus a few degrees, so uh, okay. And the black line is the spectrum that goes and hits the disk. So you see this anisotropy that I discussed before. The spectra that we observe directly are uh, uh, much or significantly harder than the spectra that go and hit the disk. This is new and nobody up to now realized it, that the source that illuminates uh, the, the disk, if it is the jet, uh, it, it, it is softer than what you see, okay? Then we did a search where we kept the two, para two parameters fixed and varied the other one. So you see here, a variation of the optical depth with R naught 100 RG and gamma naught two times 2.24. And you, the dashed line is all the backward scattered electrons, cos theta negative. Theta is the angle with respect to the magnetic field. And the black line is the photons that hit the disk. So not all backscattered photons hit the disk because the disk has a finite uh, inner radius and outer radius. So just, but notice, notice that 15, 10, 15, 20% of the input photons hit the disk, despite the fact that the jet is moving with a bulk uh, uh, gamma of, 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 of two or so. Okay. When they hit the disc, you mean to say that they are hitting the inner part of the disc or the sacros? Any, anywhere, uh, we do not do the reflection. We want to see, uh, the, we want to, to, to find the backscatter photons that hit the disc anywhere. I, I guess this is a consequence of you putting the photon sources essentially outside the jet, right? Yes. Uh, because they don't have to escape the jet, really. I mean, they, they need one scattering on the jet and then go to the disk. Correct. Um, have you made any predictions regarding 
So from, from your calculation, you get things like the, as you just showed, the observed spectrum for an observer at some angle that comes directly from the jet and that comes from the reflected disk. And then there will be a ratio in powers of these two. Yes. Or, or if you, I mean, just simply the number of photons you get from the jet, yes. if you look straight down the jet, will not be that many because most don't propagate through the whole jet. If, if no, you have a large the, tower, that is. The observer is fixed and the source is fixed, the jet is fixed. Right. So the observer has one viewing angle, one right. theta. So, right, right. So if you, if you see the system face on, you get almost nothing from the jet, I guess. Why not? Because, uh, I mean, if tau parallel. Oh, nothing the, meaning, uh, very few photons will, will uh, have. Uh, 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 traverse the entire jet is yes. what you're saying. No, it's but they, exactly they can come in the forward direction from, from lower down. Uh, from, sorry, what, what, could you repeat okay. that? Okay, in a random, the photons random walk in the jet. Yes. Okay, they can leave in any direction. Some of them leave in, in, uh, in the forward direction. But they have to go through the jet in order to do this. Yes, but the optical, if they scatter, let's say, uh, where the optical depth is one or two, uh, quite a few of them will leave without without being scattered. Yes, all of that is 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 taken into uh, account. All I all I mean is it would be interesting to know what the let's say the the power of the emission. Uh, for for an observer that sees the system phase on, I guess the power would be dominated by the reflected component. I guess I don't know this. Well, if, possibly, if large. possibly and, I have not. Yeah, and if we have not done point. any calculations. It's probably the next step uh -huh. to, to now use the uh, illuminating spectrum to see what the reflection is and add it right. to what we observe. Right. So just just a comparison between the yes. emitted jet spectrum and the reflected component, the strengths of these these two, yes. the function of viewing angle would be interesting. Okay. Well, I think in any uh, case, you're always dominated by the jet here, no? Say it again. Yeah, it's 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 a similar matter, you know. It's a Doppler it's a Doppler uh, issue, which is always uh, it's a continuous function, right? And it's um, you know decreasing function of angle continuously. So that means that uh, essentially you will always be dominated by the jet rather than the reflected component from the disk. No, why why would that be? I mean, if if the jet has tau ten, and the source of photon sits at the base of the jet. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, no photons we'll, will go through. It, it could, Asaf, yes, he's right. It, it, it could be. Uh, but uh, yes, we have not done uh, any, any calculations. Yeah. Actually, as I told you at the, at the very beginning, when I started my talk, what people do is use the so-called lamppost model. They assume a point source, an isotropic point source at some height h and vary the height until they get the reflection that is observed. Mathematically, it's fine. It's just not physical. So now what we're saying with this paper is, folks, the jet is a natural lamp post. But also, also that you put the source of photons, but I don't know the lamp post model that well, but you put the source of photons at the base of the jet. Uh, in the lamp post, do they do that? I mean, where? In, in, where... In, in, no, in the, in the, in the lamp post model, they do the Comptonization in the corona, and arbitrarily, they put a, a source of photons higher up. Arbitrarily. It's just no, no, expl no explanation. It's a mathematical uh, tool to study reflection. Nothing. No physics. No physics. So uh, it, lots of work needs to be done on, on the reflection. I'm telling you where this, the state of the art is today. Um, it, it's, it's very primitive and very unphysical. Are you considering also emission from the outer edges of the disk here? Or the, I mean, in what you're showing, this is just the jet, right? And the reflection from- No, okay. Uh, most, you, most- You put your source of photons Right at the at the base of the jet, right? Yes, have to originate there somehow, 
which means that you're assuming you have the entire radiation coming at the base of the jet, which is also the base of the disk, essentially. Yes. Are you yes. assuming that there is also radiation at the other parts of the disk? Uh, yes, and, and, and most of it uh, probably we see directly because because and then and the temp the soft spectrum that we see is a multi-temperature black body so we see other parts of the disk as long as the photon emitted photons are in the observed energy range so the outer part of the disk will emit uh, uv uh, uh, optical uh, and so on but that's different and and the the angle subtended by the jet uh, from these uh, optical emitting regions is small. So most of that optical light is, 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 is gone and does not enter the jet. If it enters the jet, then that too gets contonized. We don't take that into account. Okay, fine. Okay. So we see then the natural one that as the optical depth goes from a few to 10, uh, the uh, backscattered fraction increases. And, and despite the fact that you have some semi-relativistic bulk motion, uh, you have, have semi-relativistic motion, you get a significant number of backscattered photons. Now, the backscattered photons decrease as gamma increases, and that is natural because then most of the, at, at high gamma, most of the photons are pushed forward and do not come backward. And if we change the, the, the radius of the jet at its base, a small uh, uh, change occurs, uh, a few percent. So it's, it's nearly irrelevant. Okay. Now, we have divided the jet into zones and we count the photons that leave every zone and hit the disk. So we calculate the fraction of the input photons that illuminate the disk from height H. And H varies from ISCO or near there wherever the uh, inner part uh, is to, to uh, thousands of RG. Clearly the bottom of the jet is the most optically thick and the uh, photons are scattered there in all directions. The velocity is low in the acceleration region, therefore more or less isotropic scattering and some of these photons hit the disk. Okay, a significant fraction hit the disk. The interesting part is that as you go up and let's say from 10 RG to 1000 RG, you see this nearly constant flat fraction. So 0.1% uh, or so of the photons hit the disk and there they are, uh, they, they started their travel towards the disk from, uh, from quite high up, 10 to 1000 RG. Uh, clearly, then if you go to much higher uh, heights, then uh, this, this falls down and it becomes, goes to zero. Do you think this is affected by the, I mean, is this a consequence of the parabolic shape or something like that? Do you uh, yes. Um, uh, the parabolic shape, shape is not only observed, but it is mandatory to explain um, what, the, uh, uh, what we see. In a parabolic jet, the density falls off inversely proportional to Z. Invers inversely, proportional, uh, uh, inversely proportional to distance to Z. That means inversely proportional to distance means that the optical depth um, is logarithmic and therefore it is equal in every decade in distance. So an optical depth of, of a few means that a photon has more or less equal probability 
of being scattered anywhere in the jet. So the parabolic jet is crucial for all of this and for the uh, explanation of the time lags as a function of Fourier frequency and everything else we have done. Fortunately, this is what we, we observe. So the parabolic jet is essential. And the optical depth in our Monte Carlo calculations, we looked at the code and the optical depth in this flat part from here to there is of order unity. So the photons have equal probability of being scattered anywhere in this region. And that's why you get a flat uh, backscattered uh, fraction. This H represents the height from the accretion plane, right? The, the H is the height from the, yes, from the accretion plane, yes. And then the inner region of the disk has its own height, which is the puffed up region. No, no, that's, that's uh, no, no. In, in this calculation, the, 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 inf, the, 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 the thin disk has zero height. It's just a plane. We don't do any calculation for the reflection, for the absorption, for the uh, iron line, or for anything. We just, in this first paper, we just demonstrate that the jet sends enough photons towards the disk. That's all. Parabolic shape, I think, means that it cannot be magnetically confined, the jet. Because to get the parabolic shape, you equate the run pressure to the outside pressure, uh, and then you, you end up with a constant pressure outside. So I think this, um, the parabolic shape, you won't be able to get uh, if you're assuming it's a magnetic confinement of the jet. You yes, know, so, this, uh, ties, uh, this. Asaf, this ties to a previous question, how parabolic it stays. And I said, no, it doesn't stay. If this is a calculation, but in reality, it does not stay that, that, that uh, uh, as a, as a, as a uh, parabolic jet way up there. Okay, so this is an investigation with radius. This is an investigation with gamma, similar things. Nothing, nothing different than what I discussed. And the last view graph is the reflection fraction. This is not what you think. Reflection fraction in our community is defined as the intensity uh, that hits the disk divided by the intensity that comes to the observer. You mean from the disk or from the jet? No, not, not from. That goes to the disk. That's why it's, it shouldn't be called the reflection fraction, but it is. So this is what people use in the literature. We use the same, and I warned you that this is not the reflection fraction. The reflection fraction of your mind goes elsewhere. I'm sorry, it could is, you say one more is, time what it, what it is? Because I found that it's, confusing. It's, it's, it's written here. Yes. It's the intensity, oops, sorry. It's the intensity that hits the disk mm -hmm. divided by the intensity that the observer sees. The observer sees only just so the a function of how far the, away the, no, uh, the intensity, sorry, yes. The intensity, it's not far away, okay. Uh, the intensity that goes to the disk, to the, this is the definition. Well, okay, we know where our observer is and we put him at uh, cos theta small uh, or higher up or higher up. So this cos theta is close to the forward direction. And uh, we see the obvious that as the inner radius of the disk decreases, more and more photons hit the disk. And when the inner radius comes to about 10 RG or so, then it, the area inside there is so small that minute increase occurs and it's not uh, evident in the picture. So we calculate what the people call reflection fraction by putting the observer in different directions. And is, is L obs containing uh, also emission from the jet? Said, uh, I obs, intensity obs. 
the OBS is, 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 is exactly the, the, from the jet. And uh -huh. iDisk is the photons that go down towards the disk. Mm -hmm. the, the observed one is just from the jet or also those? The observed are... is from, from the, well, okay. It has, it has it has a, uh, a a reflected part. Let's ignore it at the moment. Okay, so it's really just from the jet. Uh, the, it's the just from the jet. The fractional photons that yes. go to the disk versus the fractional photons that go to the observer. Yes. And the values that we get here are typically what the observers uh, claim that for this for this ratio. How do they know what fraction goes to the disk? From what is reflected. They go backwards with the with their lamppost model. Uh, they uh, seen how much is reflected. They infer how much went down. It's all model dependent. Uh, okay. So, okay. Last view graph. Um, I hope that I have convinced you that Comptonization in the jet is unavoidable, and it is very important because it is the last one. So you may have Comptonization in the hot inner flow, but if you have Comptonization that is several scatterings in the jet, the outcome is the result of the jet. Even if you have a favorable mechanism for the time lags, for example, propagating fluctuations, you must also take into account the lags due to Comptonization. And people don't. They just produce the spectrum and say nothing about the lags due to computerization. And the last comment is that, in my opinion, the jet is a natural lamppost. You don't need artificial lampposts. The jet will send photons downward, whether you like it or not. And thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so more questions. If, if there is no question, I would like to explain to you physically uh, the correlation of the time lag um, with uh, the um, Fourier frequency. Are you interested in that or are you tired? If you're tired, I'll stop. I have another question, but I can take that later or, uh, or before. I have a question too. Uh, okay, first your questions. I don't want to impose on you what I like. Ask your questions. Right. Did you mention what the why why is the source? I mean, what emits the photons? It's the, okay. The uh, the the disk, mm -hmm. as Asaf said, emits. Uh, uh, right. energy is released at every radius right uh, but most of the luminosity is emitted in the inner part of the disk right okay. uh, would that would you think that is located just below the jet or extended god knows the... god knows we are playing with it we're trying to see if other observations can guide you can guide us on that Right, um, and and the, the hot regions don't produce photons. Of any interesting number, is that true? Well, what hot region? Uh, the hot electrons in all models. No, 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 no. Bremsstrahlung, that is. Yes. No, no, no. Yes, it's in, are, insignificant. Yeah. Insignificant. Yeah. Right. Okay. David, you had a question. Yeah. Um... When photons reflect off the thin disk, they don't all reach the observer at the same time. And uh, I didn't, I'm not sure if you took that into account in your calculation. Um, okay. You get light <laughs> echoing off the disk yes, itself. Uh, Dave, David, very excellent point. Uh, this is what Pablo and I are doing now. It will be our next paper. Um, the photons that go to the, towards the disk and get reflected, or uh, if the disk as uh, uh, it is uh, probably, uh, uh, so uh, the disk has an albedo, let's say 
the albedo is 0.5. So half of them are reflected and half are absorbed. The absorbed ones will come later, will be re-emitted later than the hard photons. So you expect a negative lag, exactly as what you, what, what, what you said. And that has been observed. We see the so-called reverberation lag that is from the, from the hard photons that were delayed to become hard and then became soft again and, and were, uh, uh, and, and, and were re-emitted by the disk and therefore they come after the hard ones. So it's a negative lag. We will model that. We, we have modeled that. Uh, we, we are in the process of writing. There's also a, um, an achromatic echo because different yes. parts of the disk are at different distances from the observer. Uh, okay, now uh, we do the following. In order to measure the time correctly, we take a plane anywhere between us and the source perpendicular to the direction of motion. It's, it's, it's the line of sight. It's perpendicular to the line of sight. And right. so we bring all photons in step at this plane. Okay. So we calculate exactly and correctly the time lag for all photons. Because we bring them in step at a common plane perpendicular to the direction of motion. Okay. All right. Other questions? Yeah. You showed a figure with uh, the, uh, the correlation between um, the time lag and uh, Fourier frequency. Yes. The same correlation is obtained in soft states also. But uh, in soft in, states. In what? Where, where is it obtained? What? Uh, I did not hear you. It's obtained uh, where? In the soft state of the uh, sources as well. Uh, it, it is in the same figure. So in soft state, we may not have a jet. So how to explain that lag? That, that what uh, I, I still uh, did not hear. He, uh, Asaf, can you help me? What, I, what I is mean, the word, the crucial, Asaf, crucial word? I think what Mukesh said is that in the soft state, there is no evidence for a jet. Correct. But then you argue that you are seeing these uh, correlations, right? The, the lags that you're discussing also in that state. Okay, uh, uh, I, I, did, I did not uh, say that. Uh, uh, I don't think I said that because in the soft state, there is no jet and there is no, uh, hardly any power loss spectrum. So what time lag to measure there? Okay. Time lags are measured in the hard state and hard intermediate states. It was written in the same plot. Uh, the, the same source may, was measured in soft state and hard state both in the same. Plot. Okay, this this is what what uh, what uh, Potsmith said in two thousand in two thousand. Now, in uh, what I say is that Cygnus X one never reaches the soft state. Never. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth but never reaches the soft state. If it did, it would complete the Q diagram, but it never does. So I claim that Cygnus X1, what, what, uh, uh, what uh, Potsmith et al called soft state was not a soft state. Okay, so uh, All right. student, okay. I, I have more uh, confusion. So you, you said that the accretion rates change. So when I picture a typical picture of a binary, when the matter is being supplied by the companion, it is supplying the same amount of matter that why action, accretion rates should change over time. Okay, good question. Uh, this uh, uh, is explained as follows. The accretion, uh, the, 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 the companion provides matter. The matter is stored in a ring and then 
and instability and, and if there is no friction then the ring stays there it's like the rings of uranus if an instability occurs and it does then matter begins to to flow and it the accretion rate increases reaches a maximum and then decreases and then go, goes back the, the source goes back to the storage situation so it's like the water closet uh, you flush the water the water closet water falls and then it takes some time for the uh, 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 water closet to fill in to fill and this time in in gx339 minus four is typically one or two years so every couple of years or so gx339 minus four flushes and uh, the, the, the toilet and the, the accretion rate uh, increases and then decreases and comes back to quiescence. And this is repeated, not periodically, uh, but in, uh, in a time scale of a year or two. OK. OK, if I like it so much that I would like to show it, uh, so allow me to uh, proceed to say the following. Um, Compton scattering acts like a filter. This is a statement that I will explain. It cuts off the high frequencies. This I will explain also. And here is the explanation um, before, be before that. Consider a, variability, a sinusoidal variability with frequency nu and take the inverse of that and therefore period P. If the period is large, that is if the frequency is small, uh, then any time lag of the photons will not affect this sinusoidal variation very much. In other words, a photon that was, that was emitted and came out a fraction of a period later, a small fraction of, a, of the period later, it will not affect the variability. However, if the frequency of the variability is large, that means the period is small and the time lag is comparable to the period, then a time lag will take photons from, uh, uh, from, from anywhere in the sinusoid and push them forward and the variability will be washed out. So this is what I say here. If the period of variability is smaller than the time lag, the variability is washed out. If it is larger, it will not be affected. It will not be washed out. Therefore, frequencies larger than one over time lag are not observed, according to the above. So high frequencies are not observed because they're washed out by the Compton scattering process. And here is a schematic of my jet. My jet consists of three regions, R1, R2, and R3. And let's say uh, that it is equally probable that a photon scatters here and has a time lag T1, which is typically R1 over C or it scatters here, the time lag is typically R2 over C, or it scatters here and the time lag is uh, R3 over C. Now, if the time lag is T3, that means that frequencies above T3 are washed out, sorry, are washed out. So only that part is left. If Frequencies, if, if the photon scatter here and the time is T2, then frequencies above this one will be washed out. And if it scatters here and the time is lag is T1, then the high frequencies will be washed out. So if you put them all together, you get a power law exactly new to the minus 0.7, as observed. Why a minus 0.7? Uh, we don't know. We thought 
for everybody, uh, this is very interesting, uh, Asaf. Uh, uh, everybody was saying new to the, 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 that the time lag goes as new to the minus one. We tried with Pablo and we couldn't get anything different than 0.7 or 0.8. And tried and tried very parameters did, and uh, you, you cannot imagine what we did. And then Pablo uh, spotted a paper where this was actually calculated exactly. And it was 0.7 as we had found. I don't is, know. This is, this, this is, this is, this is uh, depending on the structure of the jet that you're assuming. Of course. So of this course. Is strongly depend if, as long as you're assuming, possibly that's what you get when you're assuming a parabolic jet. If you're yes. Assuming, yes. Know, yes. 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 That, that is, that, Okay, so if we do not assume a parabolic jet, we cannot explain this with Comptonization. This is another hint that after all the other successes of the jet model, this too is, 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 is explained with the same parameters. So all our papers since 2003 explain correlations they're in the same parameters and in the same region. There is nothing different in our models. So all of the correlations that we have observed and no one else has observed, the, the standard picture has not even, they pretend these correlations do not exist. So the community does not even address these correlations, but we explain them all with one model and a restricted range of parameters. Okay. Okay. Uh, if, uh, Any further questions or comments? Yeah, I have two questions, two short ones. Okay. Uh, first of all, but they are, I think you might have addressed them actually in your summary. Um, so the first one is, wouldn't you expect it in your jet model that the injected photons actually have a time lag as well. Have they? Did you hear that? Sorry. Uh, do, uh, the injected I think I heard it. Have you a said, time lag as well. Uh, well, uh, okay. Even if they have, we start counting time at the time they enter the jet. Yeah, but I mean, you inject them monoenergetically while- No, they not monoenergetically. We we, no, 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 we, uh, we, right. we 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 emit them as a as a black body, uh, with the temperature, the inner temperature of the disk, as the observers tell us. But if they come, if it's if they propagate, I mean, in the other paradigm that you talked about in the beginning, you have photons that traverse into this hot uh, hot balloon or uh, corona, and then if they scatter further in, they get a higher energy, and that's why the time lag. But if these uh, photons scatter into the jet, the first ones to come into the jet would also be the softer photons. Yes, um, uh, this we have not taken into account. We do not know how to model the corona. So we assume, and you're correct, that the, uh, we assume that the, 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 the disk feeds <laughs> photons at the bottom of the jet. It's not correct. Ge geometrically, we know that there is a corona there that feeds the jet. So maybe a scattering occurred in the hot inner flow or, or two. So yes, I, uh, that we cannot take in, in, a, in a quantitative way into account because we do not know uh, the, the, the structure of the uh, hot inner flow and it would complicate things to start adding parameters. But okay. you are correct. Yes. Uh, uh, and then my second question is on this. Sorry. Uh, and my second question is on this lamp post. Are are there what, what, no other physical explanation for what this could be? The lamp post. Uh, the lamp post. No. Yes. There, there is no physical explanation. You cannot have a black hole in a in a in a point source standing at some height h. This is totally unphysical. What they what they what they say, what they say, but never compute, is that the hot inner flow is has a larger scale height naturally 
than the disk and some photons hit the disk. But when they tried that with such small heights, they could not explain the observations. So they need to put the source higher up. And this is where the jet comes. Okay, okay. I see, thank you. Yep. Can I, can I one final question? Uh, yes. You, in the beginning, you said there were two camps. Uh, I, I missed which, what was, what was the dividing line between the two camps? Ah, the dividing line is that the community, except for me and Pablo, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the community uh, uh, does not pay any attention to the jet. Oh, so the two camps are you and Pablo versus... Yes. Yes. We're really <laughs> the, 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 the lone cowboys. I understand. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, now, okay. Uh, look, look, look. The, there are so many correlations. And every time I go to a conference, I rub them at their faces. At some point, they will either accept that the jet does something, or they will do something with their picture to explain it. I will be happy if they prove me wrong. Not happy, but this is how science progresses. But they don't do anything. They say, ignore the jet. Uh, the rest is fine. The rest is just fine. Look, we have quantitative correlations. Then silence. Then silence. So when we published the first paper with Pablo was the last one I discussed. That is the time lag versus Fourier frequency. And we explained it nicely together with the spectrum, together with other observational facts. Well, at that time, they thought, uh, oh, yes, Comptonization uh, introduces time lags, but our corona is small. Therefore, we don't need to take that into account. This is the reply. Our corona is small. We don't need to take into account. How small? Well, small. Small enough to make the time lags small. It's really not, not, not scientific. Neither Pablo nor I are looking for a job. Therefore, I am not looking for anything. I'm retired. So uh, uh, I'm looking only for a healthy life uh, the uh, years ahead of me. Uh, but uh, what can we do? What can we do? There's... That's why I called it party line. It's really part. It's really party line. The party line is ignore the jet, and they do. Because sometimes it's very difficult to change people's minds, you know, for them to stick to what they know, and not try something else. But Asaf, correct. I accept that. I've accepted it for uh, since two thousand three. That's uh, uh, eighteen years. Uh, and I will accept it more because they are not going to change soon. Uh, but we all look at observation. We're all guided by the observations. And if you have correlations crying for an explanation, crying for an explanation, it's not science to just ignore them. It's true. This is what I'm complaining. I will be happy to see a, a, another model uh, 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 competing with us. It will push us uh, to, to make predictions. Ah, oh, by the way, our model has made predictions. The standard picture has made none. We have stuck our necks out with a specific prediction. I, I don't want to discuss it now. It's it's beyond. Uh, I need. I will introduce new things. But, but our model makes predictions. So that's if well, if 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 a scientific model does not make predictions, it's not not science for me. That I agree. Okay. Yeah. 
Correct. So well, students, there are some people who talk a lot and some people who are kept quite, uh, quite quiet. Anyone who did not say too much, do you want to add anything, to ask anything? I have a friend a uh, few years before. I, she is an observer. I asked her, why do you fit data with lamppost model? It doesn't make sense. There are a couple of alternatives. She said it's very simple to fit. And that's what most of the observers used to think in this line. Okay, I said, Sorry. I also said, Mukesh, that, that uh, the, 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 tie, the, the lamppost model is a nice mathematical tool to explore things. So I, I am not against it, but it's not physical. It's not physical. I, I would like something physical. And the jet provides a physical source that sends photons towards the disk. It may not work. I'm not, I, we haven't tried it. We don't know if, it, if we can explain uh, all the details of the reflected spectra. But at least we try physically with a physical model. Okay, well, I, I'm impressed. I, this is not this is not surprising because in GeoBiz you have the same problem with this uh, band function which people speak to, which doesn't tell you, which is very good for fitting, but doesn't tell you much about the physics behind it. No, so yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm terribly surprised to hear what you're saying about that. Do we have especially, a especially with the correlations. I mean, the Amati correlation has existed for twenty years. And they all ignore it. Yes, David, this is my complaint. I do and, not complain and, that. And um, I try to rub their faces in it uh, as much as possible. Well, that's, that's, it, that's, what, that's what I do. Uh, but it doesn't, without, it doesn't matter. It doesn't without matter. becoming obnoxious, uh, I am becoming uh, uh, a little aggressive on this and provocative. Uh, but I, I, haven't, that, I haven't seen any effect yet. I think the easiest way to make, make some people change their mind is to provide them with um, uh, other easy tools for fitting. So, so uh, it's, it's easy for them to continue to use the easy tools. And, yes. and if you say, well, this is more physical, but they can't really fit it easily, then they will continue to use the easy tools. Uh, I am not complaining. Okay, yes, uh, I've thought about it. And even for gamma uh, reverse uh, as well. Other, other people have suggested uh, it to me. Put your Monte Carlo code and all the, the calculator in, in X spec so that people can calculate spectra, time lags, and so on. Then they will use it. My complaint, I, I don't know how to do it. Um, Pablo has not shown an interest in doing it. We haven't done it but it would certainly help a lot with the observers. My complaint is with the theories. The theories pretend that the correlation does not exist. The observer needs a package to fit spectra, time lags, and all that. And what they find ready is what they use. No complaint about that. But the theorists do not pretend uh, 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 do not lo uh, look at, at the correlations or look at them and ignore them. Perhaps if you if you get the observers to use your uh, theory, then you will sort of pull the rug out of, under the theorists' feet, so to say. Possibly, possibly. Okay. Uh, yeah. I uh, uh, initially I was naive. I thought that look. We're all scientists. Um, we uh, uh, crave for the truth. And if we see something interesting, we'll try to do something like that or, 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 uh, or compete with that or, 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 or. well, uh, and I thought, okay, it didn't happen the first year, the second year, the 10th year, okay. Uh, yes, now I see that, that uh, it, it, that's, will probably, that's half the it, truth. Will, it will probably never happen. That's half the truth. But there's also the case that if you're very invested in something and you've built a good fraction of your career on some idea, 
then it will be very hard for you to let it go, I think. So, yeah. We want the truth, but we also want us to be with the ones who find the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, then then, then to, to, to those people, I say, okay, uh, put your model to work uh, to explain the correlations. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much for beautiful, beautiful talk. You, you convinced me. At least I don't know if that, that uh, helped. But uh, uh, it's, it's really beautiful. Thank you very much for a great presentation.